Good evening. Good evening. Hello at the top. Hello at the back. Hello at the front. Very, very lovely to be here. My name is Greg James. It's an honor. Cut the music. It's an honor to be here this evening to talk to one of our favorite people on planet Earth, correct? I very rarely prepare for interviews, but I bought myself a brand new laptop computer to do it tonight. So I'm gonna leave that there so I look professional. I'm actually just playing Fortnite. Shall we get him on the stage? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's Tan France! Hello! Hi! Hi. Hi, everyone! Ah. Oh. Hi! Hi! Oh, oh my God. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, you guys. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Do you like my outfit? <laughs> Hi! Did you all struggle with what you're wearing today? Did you get nervous? Are you happy with what you've chosen? You all look so good! You all look so good. Look how Greg, uh, look uh, how good he looks. Thanks. That's it. I, l I love the trainers. We can talk about his outfit later. He looks beautiful. Okay, and, and uh, sorry, I, mean, I told you I'll stand a lot and I talk a lot. Um, I was just talking about this and I just want you to Google later on. Um, Greg's glow up was fucking insane. <laughs> Look how hot he is. That's insane. Anyway, this can be a very awkward night for you. No, it's fine. I'm going to talk is, about your this attractiveness is a lot. This is literally a dream. When, when we met, I couldn't believe it happened. And then when I realized that you were even nice and you were on TV, <laughs> yeah. I thought, this is the best. Oh, we don't have to do good. anything now. You've got the biggest applause you're going to get tonight, I think. <laughs> All right, I'm out. Thanks. That's kind of it. So a quick show of hands. Can we have the house lights quickly? How many of you took an extra 35 to 55 minutes longer getting ready tonight because you were coming to see Tan? <laughs> Stressful. Fucking you, stressful, wasn't it? You know I can't... Extra stress. I bet you thought, oh, what colour socks would tan like? <laughs> you went for a bold sock. I went for a pink sock because I thought you, know, you like them. I can't see what most of you are wearing. Why did you worry so much? <laughs> That's very sweet, though. And also, a quick show of hands. How many of you are, are rocking the French tuck tonight? <laughs> We've got a front row French tucker. Well done, Frenchies. Well done. Should I have, should I have tucked? You should have. Should I? <laughs> tuck me. Do I take the belt You've off? You've got a belt on. Good belt, bad belt. How have I not, have you not learned anything from me? Should I take you, it off? Yes, you don't need a belt. Okay. okay, if you only need, you only need a belt if your pants don't fit right. And if your pants don't fit right, you've got the wrong pants on. So that's better. Yes, only wear a belt for fashion, not function, please. Fashion, not function. Fashion, not function. What's not fashion about a barber belt? <laughs> Come on. Anyway, congratulations on the book. Thank you. The book. Thank you. Thank you. This isn't very British because it's not very modest to say, but it's a New York Times bestselling book at this point, which oh is my a lovely feeling. I can't believe it. I cried a lot. Well, it's a triumph. And I, I read it over the weekend, and it is funny, and it is sweet, and uh, it's boldly written in places as well. We're going to get to that uh, in, a, in a bit. But why now? Why did you write the book now? You know, I, uh, so I'm on a show called Queer Eye, which I assume most of you know. Um, and, uh, and Queer Eye, there's five of us on Queer Eye. We're called the Fab Five. And every episode there, uh, we focus on a hero. So the episodes are like 44 minutes long. Um, and we focus on a hero. And so you don't really get to hear the story of all of us boys. We, you get a snapshot of it. But um, people kept saying, you need to tell more of your story. We don't see people like you on TV represented a lot. And I thought, I don't want to say too much because I don't want people to edit the shit out of what I'm saying and then give you a watered down version of it. And so, um, so I decided to write the book because I wanted to tell my story my way and to give you a viewpoint that you may not, never have considered before. Let's go back to the beginning then. And the, the Asian boy in South Yorkshire, yeah. a strict traditional upbringing, yeah. Surrounded by Barbie dolls. Yes. <laughs> which Barbie I loved. So. But then there was sort of like a, a, a battle between the men of the household to get more Barbies, right? We're, we're very competitive about our Barbies in my culture. Competitive Barbies. Yeah, you'd be surprised. Did you always, when you, when you were growing up there, did you always think that there was a, a bigger thing for you? Did you always think you'd get out as quick as you possibly could and try something else? Is anybody from South Yorkshire here? 
cover your ears real quick. No, no, I'm joking. Okay, I get up a lot, you'll get used to that too. Uh, uh, okay, you know South Yorkshire. It's beautiful. Have any of you been to, uh, everybody's been to South Yorkshire, or a small town in England. You know what it's like, it, there aren't that many uh, people that look like me. And so the hard thing is, is that I, I didn't think I was desperately wanting to get out of South Yorkshire, but I did know uh, that I, I didn't really want to suffer through the things I was suffering through. And so I'd watch American TV. I loved American TV. And I thought, one day, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out to America and live that Californian life. Um, and so, yeah, I desperately wanted to get out. The, the, the book starts in South Yorkshire. It, it uh, follows my life from when I was basically born until uh, Queer Eye and, and, and what it's like to be a person in this industry. And the reason why I wanted to talk about life in England and South Yorkshire is because of this. I promise you the book's really lighthearted, right, Greg? <laughs> really lighthearted, it really is. However, there are some things that uh, are, are really hard to read, and I needed it to be that way because I, need, I wanted you guys to get a really honest version of me, not just some, let me tell you about all the cute bits, like what it actually is like uh, to be a person of color in South Yorkshire. And so um, it starts in a really hard place, which is um, when I was in South Yorkshire, let me preface it by saying I love South Yorkshire. I think it's beautiful, and the majority of people are wonderful. It re they really are. They're wonderful. <laughs> um, however, there are always pockets of fuckwits everywhere. <laughs> And, uh, oh, and if there's anybody under the age of 15, you should have known what you were signing up for. It's not my fucking fault. If your parents are here, shame on you for bringing your kids to hear me swear. Um, and if you're going to learn to swear, you may as well learn it from me. Who better to learn from? Um, <laughs> what a role model. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful role model. Um, and so, I, uh, so, yeah, in my hometown, uh, there was a pocket of fuckwits like everywhere else. And... Uh, and when I was about five, the, the story starts when I was about five, I used to walk to school with my brother. My parents were immigrants, and they worked many, many jobs, many, many hours. And so I had to go to school with my brother. Um, I'm the youngest of five. And I would get really upset when he was, at, uh, when he was off school. He was, um, he was sick. And I would say uh, that I was really ill, and my mom would know I wasn't. And so I'd have to go to school. And it was only two streets away, five to 10-minute walk. And I would really panic because I knew I'd have to find a white family to walk close to or a white lady to find to walk close to because I knew that if I didn't, somebody would beat the shit out of me. Usually somebody in their late teens, very early 20s, would kick the shit out of me because I was brown. And when people watch Queer Eye, they think, oh gosh, what a privileged life Tam must have led. He's always so smiley and so happy. No, I got to this point because I'd been through so much shit as a kid. I learned to put a smile on my face. There was no alternative. Um, and so... I, I needed the book to be really honest. I needed you to understand that even now, in this day and age, in, in, in England, kids are going through this. They really are. And it wasn't a case of me playing the race card. Every day getting to school was a fight for survival. Every day walking back from school was a fight for survival. And I didn't know if I was the only one. And I spoke to my family and friends um, when I was re writing this book. And it's shocking that every one of them went through exactly the same thing I went through. And that's a sorry state of affairs. If you think of... If you've got a kid who's a five-year-old, if you've got a niece or a nephew, just think of your five-year-old, what, what that person is like at five, thinking that they should never understand the importance of their color at that age and that they might be attacked by a 20-something-year-old, an 18, 19, 20-year-old for being brown at the age of five. That was, that was what life was like for me in Yorkshire. And now in your work and your job, particularly on Queer Eye, you, in a way you, you kill with kindness. Yeah, you, you almost go so far the other way that everything is met with complete love and kindness. Yeah, I. Uh, here's the thing. Is that a, that's a that's because of that? So that that's a direct. Yeah, well, so result I, of that. I, I, when I was a kid, I didn't understand um, that it didn't help to say, "Oh fuck off, you bastards!" Um, like that. That's all I knew how to do. I'd swear at them. Yes, I swore at the age of five. Go fuck yourself. Um, don't judge me. Um, <clears throat> no, yeah, I, I swore from a really early age, and that was the way I would try and solve, solve the problem uh, because I wasn't smart enough to realize that that didn't do anything, and that actually agitated them even more. And so by the time I hit my teens, I, I learned to just be nice to them um, and try, stupidly try to reason with them or make them laugh, and that's how I got them to stop attacking us. Um, I, I, I mentioned a time in my book uh, uh, when I hit like 10 or 11, and I mentioned just one situation where they really got us. But on the whole, it, it worked. Like I would 
I would do what I do on Queer Eye now when somebody asked me if I'm a terrorist on Queer Eye, which is legitimately something that happened um, because they found out that I was Pakistani. It was Tom Jackson, episode one. Um, <laughs> and I, didn't, I, didn't, I wasn't angry at him. I really wasn't angry at him. He just didn't know because he had never met anybody like me. He just thought, oh, if he's Pakistani, he must be a terrorist, so I'm going to ask him about it. Um, and uh, <laughs> I know, sweet Tom. Um, so, I mean, sweet in a way. Not sweet. Silly Tom. Yeah. And, uh, and so, yeah, I, 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 I learned, what the, the thing that I do now on the show is what I've done for over 25 years. I've tried to reason with people who don't understand that we're, we're just the same as them. Well, actually, well, well, as, you, as, you, as you brought up the T word, yeah. um, we'll talk about the terrorist thing. Because um, that was one of the things that shocked me about the book, was that you, it's very, the real lightness of touch throughout the whole thing. It's very conversational, it's very funny. The chapter headings are things like wallets, yeah. and, you know, and then suddenly you've got a bit about 9-11. Yeah, I really which, ease you in. <laughs> yeah. Which... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, chapter one. Yeah. <laughs> 9 11. Yeah. But um, I thought that was a really bold thing to write, and I think it's a really Thanks. important thing that you wrote it. And was that always the plan for this book to, to really jump about and, and <coughs> tackle those big things? Um, uh, so when somebody asked me to write the book, it was about a month after season one came out. Um, and I was like, oh, I'm, I'm not going to write a book. I've got nothing to talk about. Um, anyone who knows me knows I never shut up. I've always got something to talk about. I've always got something to say. No, no. I uh, know. Um, and I was like, no, I, I've got, I, I wouldn't even know where to start. And then uh, when I really got thinking about it, this chapter was the one reason I said, okay, I'll do this. But then I was too much of a pussy to actually put it into the, the book. Um, because it's a really hard thing to talk about. My, I, I, I live in America. I've lived in America for 11 and a half years. Um, and that is my home. And so uh, it was hard to write because I, I was worried about what the Americans might say. Um, and so I didn't add it in my book until after the book closes. So, it closed. so what happens is when you sign a book deal, they give you your closing date. So by that point, you must have finished your book completely. And so my closing date was met a couple of weeks later. I, I couldn't sleep for about two weeks after my book closed. And I was, I was nervous every night thinking, I've done myself an injustice, a disservice. I've done my people a disservice. I haven't mentioned the one thing that, uh, that I really should be talking about, the elephant in the room. Um, and so I called my publisher and I was like, listen, I, I need to add one more chapter. She was like, no, that's stupid. Like, it, we're two, two weeks out. Like, it's not possible. I was like, if you, here's the thing. Here's how much of a vile bitch I really am. I was like, well, I'm not doing it. If you don't, like, I will cancel the book deal. You can have your fucking money back. Um, and I won't go on tour. Um, <laughs> And so uh, <laughs> apparently I was quite powerful because then they said, okay. Um, and so they added the chapter in. And uh, the reason why I needed this chapter to be added in was because uh, I have the luxury of a platform like no one else um, in, from my community. There's never been a Pakistani gay guy on a platform like this. Netflix is a global uh, platform and, uh, and I, my voice is heard globally if I use it. Um, and it's also known if I don't use it. And so um, I wanted to use this chapter to explain what it feels like when you go through American customs. Like when you, uh, many of you, I'm assuming, have been through American customs. You've been to the US. And it says, never forget, never forget, never forget, never forget everywhere, which I totally get. We shouldn't forget the people that lost their lives in 9-11. However, what 9-11 means for me and my people is this. Every time we go through customs, we are treated as if we are a terrorist uh, or terrorists. And uh, every time we walk the street, this is in Engl England, this is in America, people assume that if you're Pakistani or you're Muslim, you must therefore be affiliated with terrorism. And so I, I understand why people uh, are scared. We are also scared. Um, when I watch the news and I see what's happening across the world, I'm worried also. But what people don't think uh, is that w we're concerned. They say, well, we're, we're worried because we're the target. We're also the target. But the worrying thing is, is that so when 9-11 happens or an attack happens, the terrorists aren't calling me and saying, hey, Tan, um, <laughs> do you want to go to Marbella? Like, go to Marbella, like we're planning an attack. No, just because I'm Muslim doesn't mean that I'm exempt from any of that stuff. So what happens is that we're terrified as much as anyone in this room who's Caucasian. We're just as terrified. But what also happens is that we're also terrified 
every time we walk the streets because somebody is bound to call us something disgusting because they assume that we're terrorists. So our threat is daily, daily. And so that's why I thought it was so important to mention this is I want people to remember that every time we're never forgetting, we're never forgetting that my people are actually people too, not terrorists. Those terrorists are a tiny fraction of a community. They don't represent anybody I know. Thank you. And that, I think, is, you've just summed up exactly why you're a truly fucking great thing to have in the world. Thanks. You really are. Thanks, mate. Can we talk about Rob? Yes. <laughs> if Let's you don't know who Rob, Rob is, Rob is my husband. He's the original France. The original. After the country, I The guess. original. Yeah. <laughs> they can have that. You can have that. They named the country after him. They did. He's very special. You said in your book that marriage is the easiest part of your life. Yeah. Which is a, a phrase that made me sort of beam. That's a really beautiful Thanks. thing to say. Thanks. How did you meet him? And what was the first encounter like? <gasps> I don't mean the encounter in that way. I mean, you can tell. Yeah. Unfortunately. What it was, was it like? It wasn't. I wish I could tell that story, but he refused me on the first night. Um, okay, it's... He's standing up again. I'm standing up again. It's my favorite chapter of the book. Okay, let me explain this. So yeah, at the end of the show, he's going to be on high wires and just float. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be defying across. gravity. Um, and so, yeah, so uh, it's my favorite chapter in the book because of this. So um, uh, I was uh, living in England, but I was traveling to Salt Lake regularly. I had some friends out there. And, uh, and I was visiting because I loved it, and I was scouting out the place because I was thinking of moving there. And, uh, and I used to go out to these bars and clubs with some of my, uh, my then gay friends, a couple of gay mates, and we'd go to the bars and clubs. I don't go to bars and clubs anymore. I'm way too old for that shit. Can't stand it. Um, <laughs> That's not a life I want to live. Um, and so I would go, no judgment, if you live in a bar or a club, wonderful for you. Um, <laughs> And so I would go out to these, uh, these gay bars and, uh, the, uh, okay, Utah, let me preface this by saying, Utah is the whitest place you will ever go. Um, and Salt Lake City is very, very white. I'll see like a brown person every now and then and I'm driving past them and I stop and I'm like, are you lost? Can I help you? Do you, uh, do you need a ride? Like you can't possibly live here. Um, and, and so I'm the local racist. And so, uh, <laughs> And so I, uh, I, I will. Uh, so I, I was uh, going to these bars and clubs, and these boys who my friends fancied would hit on me because I was foreign and I had this accent that the Utahns fucking love. Like they will <laughs> drop trow if they hear you say hello in this accent. <laughs> and so, uh, and so they put me on this website, and they're like, "We're not going to mention that you're British. We're not going to mention." that you're Pakistani, we're just gonna put a picture of you up there and you can say whatever you want about what you do, what you're looking for, that kind of thing, fine. I wasn't interested in dating, I was single. I had my heart broken by a guy in England like a year, six months prior and I told myself I was gonna be celibate. And, um, and, and, and so this guy had broken my heart so badly, he, uh, uh, he's, he's still single so go fuck yourself. Um, <laughs> No. <laughs> no, JK, JK, JK. He's not, he's actually not, he's not single. Um, and he's here tonight. <laughs> Dave! No, he's actually a really good friend of mine. He really is a good friend of mine, but he is still single, so there you have it. And, um, and uh, it's it bad to be him when you break up with 10 friends. And so, because I'm going to put you on blast, bitch. And so, um, and so he, uh, so I was, I was trying to be celibate, I was, I'd gone, I, I, I wasn't celibate for six months, that's insane. But I was single for six months. Um, and so I, uh, I, I was gonna try and be single, if not celibate. Oh my God, there really are kids there. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I am, I really didn't think, I'm so, I thought they weren't letting anyone in under 18. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm not gonna stop, but there you have it. Um, and so I, uh, so I, uh, I get lost a lot. And so, you were, you were talking about uh, shagging Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was. Close your ears. And so I, uh, I, I wasn't doing very good a very good job of being celibate, but I was still single. And so he asked me, uh, so he messaged me, and he was like, um, his, literally his DM was this. Um, it was on a, a site called Connection. It was, it was very appropriate. There was nothing inappropriate ever, ever sent. It was like gay Facebook. And so he messaged me, and, uh, and he was like, oh, you don't look like you're from around here. And my response was, yeah, no shit, Sherlock. And clearly, he really liked to be abused. 
And so uh, he kept on, uh, kept on messaging me, which was so nice. So I just kept going in on the abusive messages. And about four days later, he wore me down. He kept asking me, Will you, can we go out on a date? Can we go out on a date? No, 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 thank you. I'm not dating anymore. Um, I'm trying to not be a hoe. And <laughs> he, uh, and so did, did you guys ever watch the show Will and Grace? Okay. So Will and Grace, uh, um, there's a reason why I'm telling you Will and Grace. So Will and Grace, uh, they had two friends, Rob and Ellen. Rob and Ellen loved to go to a place called the Olive Garden. Now, uh, and, uh, but Will and Grace never wanted to go to the Olive Garden because apparently it was the most boring restaurant in the world. And so, um, and so I asked Rob, I was like, hey Rob, um, I will go on a date with you, but have you ever heard of a place called the Olive Garden? And he was like, yeah, Dick, of course I've heard of it. It's like, it's basic. let me explain it to you if you haven't been to America. So Olive Garden is as basic as like Pizza, uh, Pizza Express. Like think of it of like, as like Pizza Express. You go to Pizza Express, but you don't expect like a, a, a nice meal. Like it's just there. Like it's a thing. I feel, I feel like I want to pull you up on the Pizza Express thing. I mean, <laughs> I can't say, I, I mean, I agree with everything else you're saying. What's the most basic restaurant you can think of? Like the most basic? Nando's. You're a bitch. You're a bitch. He's a vile bitch and I've always known it. He just hides it well on the radio. Um, no, it, you think Nando's is more basic than Pizza Express? Nando's is more basic than Pizza Fuck Express. Fuck off. No, no. It we're is. Sticking with, we're sticking with Pizza We've Express. We've lost you to LA, darling. <laughs> you don't know what you, where you are we're, anymore. We're sticking with Pizza Express. So just think, like, imagine during this, uh, this chapter, when you're reading this chapter, just imagine Pizza Express, right? <laughs> don't listen to him. And so, uh, so he was like, yeah, of course we've got um, uh, Olive Garden here. Uh, we've got them everywhere. I was like, I would like to go to there, please. Um, <laughs> and he was like, are you sure? Like, it's, it's not great. It's just like basic. Yes, I really, really want to go there. And I was telling my friend, if Rob, this guy can entertain me in what is quite possibly the most boring place on the planet, maybe he's worth dating. I am one of those people who really loves to play a game. I'm very manipulative, and that's, <laughs> that's my dating style. You know, this book isn't, um, isn't not, it's not a self-help book. It's uh, like a cautionary tale, it's a what not to do in your dating life. But for me, it worked, it was 11 years ago, things have changed. And so the thing that I love most about the Olive Garden is this. You walk into the Olive Garden, and, uh, and this is what we did. You walk into the Olive Garden, you're like, hi, can I have a table for two? And they will say, hopefully, yes. And the next question is my favorite thing. What are you celebrating today? <laughs> and you look around and you're like, I'm at fucking Pizza Express. <laughs> I'm at Pizza Express. You think we're celebrating something at Pizza Express. It's like going to the McDonald's drive-thru and they say, oh, are you looking for wedding venues? No, <laughs> it's McDonald's, you dickhead. No, it's fucking Pizza Express or the Olive Garden. No, we're just on a fucking date. Anyway, if you ever go to America, go to the Olive Garden. They've got breadsticks and Alfredo sauce. That's wonderful, but everything else is just shite. And also, <clears throat> it's overpriced tat. Anyway, so we, we, we had a lovely day. Um, <laughs> This is only 45 minutes. I'm going to try and cut most of my questions, my answers down after this. But it was a 45 minute. It was meant to be like a, 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 a short date, just lunch. Even though it was the most boring place on earth, he actually kept me entertained for hours. And then instead of going home, we ended up going for, to a movie, Bridewards. I know it was the only thing that was on that, that day. Um, and then we went to, uh, for coffee and dinner. And then it was bliss. Like he was the nicest guy I'd ever met. I Wait, I've got one more thing to tell you, which is fucking hilarious. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Okay, one more thing. I promise you, I'll move on. I'm to the fine. Next one. I'm, just having um, a, I'm having a nice okay. time. Rob is from a state called Wyoming. If you don't know, if you've never been to America, Wyoming is also the second whitest place in America, <clears throat> and they definitely don't have people like me there. And so, Rob, uh, the whole time we were chatting, because I hadn't said that I was British, he assumed I was Mexican. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Rob's a racist. <laughs> Rob's a racist. He married me so that he can forever say, well, I'm not racist, I married him. <laughs> He's a racist. Yeah. If you well, ever meet him. So you, so you live happily with your racist husband. Yeah. Rob, in Utah. Yes. And do you feel like that's home? 100% home. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it's home because... Uh, it's, it's beautiful, the people are super, super nice. Um, we've created a home there, it's my sanctuary. The, the, this, <clears throat> sorry, 
I've been on this tour for quite some time, and my throat is quite painful at this point. <laughs> um, I, uh, it's, it's, uh, there's so much of my life has changed over the last uh, couple of years in particular. And so when I get home, life is just the same. Like when mm. people say, your life has changed so much, my job has changed so much. But my actual life, um, I go back to, excuse me, as I belch. I go, but you know how on Queer Eye they try and peg me as the classy one because I'm the English one? Like, I'm fucking trash through and through. I just hide. There's just a really good editing team. I'm fully working class. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, the, uh, the, there's something about Utah that feels really special that reminds me of who I am. Um, because actually, this is going to sound stupid, I know, but Salt Lake City is kind of it feels like home, it feels like South Yorkshire, it's a small community, people say hello every morning, it feels like a small, it doesn't feel like a, 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 a crazy big American city. Do you feel like you'd live in the UK again? No. No, and, and, and listen, I want to I be really, really honest, um, people, people don't usually ask me that, um, and I, 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 I love the UK, I love coming back uh, for a few days at a time, no, I, I was totally serious. I, I, look, I look, come back for a few days at a time, and it brings me so much joy. And I love London. I love going up to the north. I really do. However, I have, I've, I've had some really rough, rough, rough times in England. And the lovely thing about Salt Lake is when I first went there, it was the first time ever. You guys are going to think I'm playing the race card, and I need you to understand that if you don't know somebody who's Asian or of color, you will, you will never understand. You need to expand your group. If everybody in your group looks like you, there's a problem. Like, meet people who, who are not Caucasian. Or if you're brown and you've only got brown friends, meet other people. Like, learn about what other people go through. Because I, in Salt Lake, the reason why I loved it so much the very first day is because for the first time ever, I, I, I knew nobody, nobody was going to call me something disgusting in the street. They weren't seeing me as less than because I'm Pakistani. And I felt that for so, so, so many years. I was always worried that somebody was going to call me the P word in the street. I was actually home uh, a year and a half ago. Queer Eye came out 16 months ago, 15 months ago. And about a month before Queer Eye came out, I went to Manchester, which is where my family lives. And I got the bus from a mum's house into town. And as I got off the bus in town, Somebody said, fucking Paki, we pay for you to live. And I remember thinking, God, even with my new job, even with all this new life that I have now, I still am susceptible to that shit. And I just thought, I'm really, really glad I don't have to put up with this every day. Um, that's a really sad feeling, a really sad feeling. And listen, I'm not saying, please know that I'm not saying that everyone's like that. Of course I know. Just like those fucking moronic terrorists, they're a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of a community, but I, do, I don't have to worry when I'm walking down the streets of Salt Lake. I don't have to worry that somebody's gonna swear at me or call me something disgusting just because I'm a person of color. And I, I please know that I'm not saying anything negative about the, the UK. I love coming home and I feel really proud to be British. I just, I don't wanna worry about walking down the street anymore. And nor should you. Yeah. Absolutely, you shouldn't feel bad. For, you know, I think everyone would wish you happiness, mm -hmm. wherever that is, and it feels like you have a home in Utah, and yeah. you have to, and you talk about people saying, your life has changed so much, but yeah. if your life is sorted, you can go off and do amazing magical adventures and then return back to it. So that yeah. seems to be what you and Rob have. Yeah, and I have the luxury of going around and doing all these great things and then coming back and using my voice to say, hey, wait, maybe treat each other in a kinder way. Yeah. Shall we talk about- oh My God, it's hot on this stage. <laughs> Holy shit. Well, I feel that, I think that was an amazing, that was an amazing thing you just said. I think it's quite, it Thanks. takes quite a lot to say those sorts of Thanks. things out loud. Please know I'm not throwing shade at you. We know, you, we know you're not throwing shade. Yeah. That's, we, we totally know. And you're, you, should be, you should live Thanks. wherever you want to live. Thanks. But, you, th but things might have been different. Rob might have, you know, you might have found a Rob here and then your home could have been I here. Know. Could, these things are very, <laughs> so they, they, they change very quickly. I'm really glad I didn't because Rob is a, does rodeo. Do you? Uh, and there's not, I mean, there's not a lot of that going on There's here. definitely not a lot of that here. And watching that fucker do that shit is the hottest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> like it is a, you know when you're a kid and you dream of what you might be like when you're older and who you might marry? Like I remember thinking, oh, a cowboy. And then I found one. <laughs> I actually found one. Okay, we found the real reason he's not coming back. There, there we go. There's the I truth. I found my chaps wearing cowboy. Let's talk about your... Your careers, like yeah. your multiple careers. So yeah. in, in your book, you talk about, you, you said you had over 30 jobs between the age of, you okay? Yeah, yeah. I've got a hair out of place. 13 jobs between the age of 16 and 27. Yes. That's a lot. So yeah. everything I was from- a terrible employee for are a you really long time. <laughs> Sorry, you're checking your hair with your phone. Yeah, I just need to make sure that, 
hair's right. My hair's my, my hair's my thing. Um, and so uh, here's the thing. I uh, so before I I got queer eye, I was uh, I think people think I was just always a show business person. I definitely was not, um, and I'm assuming Greg's going to get to that later. I definitely wasn't a show business person. I was a business owner. I was a designer, um, but I had to be that because I can't work for other people um, because I'm a fucking nightmare. Um, I don't take authority well at all. I can't be told what to do. I, I shan't be told what to do uh, by anyone. <laughs> I shan't. I shan't be told. I sh shall not can, be I, can I just pick you up on that quickly? I think that's really interesting. And I think a lot of people who would watch Queer Eye would just go, that's Dan, he's lovely, he's so nice to everyone. He's so but you, twice tonight you've said that you were, I think you said that you were um, fucking vile, vile at one point. Vile. And then you just said you were a nightmare. And I think nightmare. that's interesting because I think people watching the show would be like, hey, he's just so easy going. No. He's so British and lovely. It's a nightmare. As an employee, I'm, I'm lovely as a person, <laughs> but I'm a terrible employee. Here's the thing, I'm a terrible employee because I'm very resolute, and you don't need a resolute person as an employee, you need somebody who's gonna listen to what you tell them. But for me, um, every time somebody would tell me what to do, I'd think, I know a better way to do that that's gonna make you more money, why won't you listen to me? Um, and so I had many, many jobs, uh, and my, I had a lovely um, habit, yes, I'm gonna go, uh, I had a lovely habit, um, so th this is also why I'm a nightmare. Uh, uh, you'll, I I'm hoping the, the book will convince you that I'm also nice, just there's many bad stories in there. Uh, and I told everyone I was gonna get really real, so here it is. So, um, I would start a job, so I, got, I was really good at getting jobs. I'm very, very good at an interview. I don't have many skills in life, but I can sell you on hiring me any day of the week. And so I, uh, I would get these jobs, and within a few minutes I'd be like, oh, not happy here. And, uh, and the reason why is because I'd, I'd see the team and I'd think, they're just not my kind of people. D you, must be, you must know within a few minutes, like if you're gonna get along with somebody. Yeah. Within a few minutes, you just know. And so often, if somebody can't have a laugh, and I actually, as so I was speaking to uh, Greg's wife, Bella, Bella's in the audience and she's beautiful and she's wonderful, and let me explain uh, something that we were talking about. Uh, there's a show called 30 Rock. 30 Rock is a massive American show. It's really funny. Uh, and if I find out that somebody has seen 30 Rock and they don't like it, instantly I'm like, you may be fine, but you're not my person. You, we can't be friends. Um, I'm sure you're lovely, but we're just not gonna share a sense of humor. And I need to share a sense of humor with somebody. I need somebody that can really take the piss out of themselves. Um, and so Sub that's... Substitute 30 Rock for Pizza Express. Yeah, <laughs> rude. Um, and so I was, uh, and so I was, uh, starting the, working at these jobs thinking, oh, they're, they're nice, but they're just not my people. And so I had this wonderful habit of doing this. First day, couple of hours in, realized I don't want the job. Oh, I'm really hungry. Is there any chance I could take lunch early? It's your first day. Uh-huh. I'm really hungry. I'd really like to take a lunch early. Look how skinny I am. I'm withering away. Um, okay. Can you pick me up something too? Yeah, sure. Of course I will. You know what a good guy I am. Of course I'll pick up that food for you. And then I would go and never come back. I, I had close to 30 jobs um, between the age of 16, 17, and 24, legit. Actually, I had way more than that. I just stopped counting. I used to check them off every time, uh, tick them off every time I'd quit one. And I did it always the same way. A couple of hours in, ooh, hungry, yeah, bye. And they, they would always call, hey, Tan, where are you? Did you eat? The amount of people that must have thought I died is insane. <laughs> Insane, but I was too much of a coward to say, I'm sorry, you're just the worst. I really don't want to come and work with you again. <laughs> and so I just wouldn't answer their calls. Anyway, that's what you get when you hire Tan France. <laughs> well, which leads us nicely on to talk about the hiring that changed your life, which was the audition process for a show called Queer Eye. Yes. And this was an audition that Rob said you should go for. Yeah. And you weren't necessarily going to go I for it. I wasn't going to go for it. Um, Talk us through that audition process. Yeah. If we don't know about it. Yes. When did you meet the, the rest of them okay. and all the rest of that? So uh, before I can explain, I'm going to give you a snapshot of what happened before then. So I, uh, I wasn't working well with other people. Um, I don't play well. And so I had to start my own businesses. I started my own businesses. They did really well. I had three of them. They did incredibly well. And so uh, I, and I was going through a bit of a hard time. I did all I needed to do. So I decided to sell them and I retired. Um, 
That's not a joke. I actually did. I retired at 33 and it was wonderful. Um, I, uh, I had a plan to and, and, and thankfully I made it work. And, uh, and so I had retired and I, I'd taken my first vacation with my husband. We, we were just going to vacation a lot and uh, we were going to have kids a few years down the line and, and that was going to be my life. I was going to be a stay-at-home dad. And, um, and then uh, we went to Vegas and a few days later I got a call from a friend of a friend uh, who worked for Netflix. And they'd seen on my Instagram that I had announced that I'd retired, I'd sold my business, um, I'm chilling, peace out. And uh, so they contacted me and said, we hear that you're free. Uh, one of the people at Netflix is, uh, has seen your Instagram stories many times, and, um, and we think that you should be the, the star of the show. And I was like, shut up, Dickhead. Like, no, thank you very much. Hang up. Didn't, I was like, no thanks, I, I have no interest in show business. I'm chilling with my husband by the pool. Um, and then I turned to my husband, I was like, hey, uh, I just got this really weird call from Netflix. Um, they want me to be on a show. And so I explained it to him and he was like, you should at least take the call, like it's Netflix. Um, and so he convinced me, he was saying, listen, you've gone on and on and on about you, you don't have gay friends. Um, and it sounds like there's gonna be a lot of gay people at this audition. <laughs> probably exclusively gay people. I was like, oh yeah. Um, and so I was like, okay, I'll, I'll take the call at least. So we had a Skype call, went really well. It was meant to last 20 minutes, it lasted two hours, went really well. And then they invited me out for, um, for a live audition. There's so much more that happened in between, you'll read about it in there. Um, and, so, uh, and so I went to the audition, <coughs> um, 9,000 people auditioned for the job. When we, yeah, I know it was a lot. Um, and, then, uh, and then they whittled it down to 42 people, 42 gay men. And, uh, and so I went for this audition. Uh, <laughs> and went for this audition. And I thought, I'm not going get, to get the job, so I have no interest in trying. I just want to go and find gay friends. And <laughs> there's a room full of gay guys, and I'm very sociable. Um, and so I'm bound to make gay friends. And so it lasted three days. They are filming the whole time. They play a bunch of games. And I met these four boys who were wonderful and they just so happened to be my fab five, uh, my fab four. And uh, so we were getting along really well and actually Bobby created this text thread on the second night that was called the fab five. Even if we didn't get the job, we hadn't got the job at that point, but even if we didn't get the job, we were like, we're gonna be friends. We know we're gonna be friends. We get along so, so, so well, um, which was lovely. And I, we, we all felt exactly the same way. And so I, I left the audition thinking, that was lovely. I, I made some gay friends. I did exactly what I came to do. Um, and then I went home, didn't think anything of it. I mean, I waited five days thinking, gosh, this is intense, waiting for the call. But I wasn't worried about it because I, I knew I hadn't gotten the job. They wouldn't give me the job. Everybody else who was at the audition, I know from TV, I've seen what they do before. They are show business people. I am not a show business person. Wasn't going to get the job. Five days later, they called me and they said, hey, um, you've got the job. And I was like, oh, that's <gasps> puked, <laughs> barfed my guts up bath my guts up and then I was like oh thank you so much um that's really nice I don't want the job and they're like what the fuck are you talking about of course you want the job I was like no I came to make gay friends I found my gays and I ran like got them did all I needed to do, got them, and now these are my gays for life. And I'm gonna nurture them, we're gonna make sure that we stay strong and that's it, that these are gonna be my gays. Um, and so they were like, okay, well, would you at least think about it? Nah. <laughs> anyway, see ya. Um, and then uh, I called my husband, I was like, you never guess what? <laughs> they offered me the fucking show. <laughs> Dum-dums. Anyway, um, and then I called them back, I was like, okay, I'll take the job. And then I continued to try and quit week after week after week. Um, legit, like, tried to quit so during many During filming? Yeah, during <laughs> filming. So during, during the first season, you didn't really want to be there? L no, okay, I did. You, you're, uh, you're leading uh, them into a very bad place. You're no, just doing I, my job, darling. Yeah, no, let me tell you this, okay. Uh, I did want to be there. So uh, you heard earlier, I'm a professional quitter. And so I made a career of it for, for 10 years almost. And so I, uh, that's all I knew how to do. But the reason I wanted to quit is this, and legit, this is serious. The reason I wanted to quit is this. When you, uh, when you, they kept saying, oh, you're the, you're the first of your kind on a, such a big show. And they kept telling me how big the show was. It was the, the biggest show Netflix had ever done. It was the first fully global show. And I was like, holy shit, that's a lot of pressure. Um, 
And so I was really scared. And I'd never been on TV before. All the other boys had been on TV before. And so they were used to the cameras. I was not. And so I'd go on set and I would cry all the time. I would do my scene uh, with uh, whoever. And Tom Jackson actually was a really hard one because he was my first episode. On the first day, he asked me if I was a terrorist. And I answered the question. And then I went to the bathroom. I cried so hard thinking, I can't do this. Like, I really can't do this. I can't have that interaction every day. That's just going to destroy me. And so I cried really hard every time uh, we, we took a break. Um, and so the, the first few weeks were really hard for me two weeks and then finally two and a half weeks in we all share an apartment building when we film and uh, the executive producer who is the person a person who runs the whole show basically um, i went to his apartment at 11 30 at night i texted him saying can i come down and see you yeah sure went down to see him i stood at his door uh, and i said i quit i'm so sorry i quit i i booked my flight back home to salt lake tomorrow morning i leave at nine something um I, I'm, I'm not doing the show anymore um if you don't sue me, I won't sue you. <laughs> and he looked at me, and, and I thought that he was looking like he was going to be angry. And so I was like, I've got money too. I'm fucking retired. You think I can't sue you? And he was like, whoa. Like, where did that come from? He was like, calm down. We just don't want you to quit. Like, let's talk about it. And the reason is, so I felt the pressure. I really felt the pressure of being on camera. I really felt the pressure of people seeing me as something that I didn't want to be. I just wanted to do a fun show and have fun and not have to worry about people thinking of me as a certain thing, uh, which I'll explain in just a moment. <clears throat> and uh, he convinced me to do the show because I, my main concern was the other boys, I love them so much, but they are... They know how to turn it on. They'll do hello, and they're American all of a sudden. Like, they're American the whole time, but when the cameras come on, they are like, wow. Um, and I didn't know how to do that. I was very, very English. I was like, I'm never going to be able to be that person. And so I was like, I, look, I'm very, very English. And he was like, do you think at any point we didn't realize you were fucking British, you moron? Um, and he was like, that's exactly why we wanted you. You are very different from them. You offer a completely different thing. Um, we wanted you for these reasons, the qualities that you have. Just continue to do what you're doing. You're exactly the person we were desperately wanting you to be. And I was like, wonderful. So at that point, I got more comfortable. And the reason why I was nervous is this. Also, I knew full well what the press was going to do, and they continue to do it. Uh, and this is partly the reason why I wanted to write this book, to explain that we're not all the same. When, they write, when the press, er, ever since the show came out, actually a week before the show came out, the announcement was made that we were doing the show. And they've done the, the same every time they write about the show. Anthony Porofsky, food and wine guy. Bobby Burke, interior design. Pakistani, immigrant, tan France. I'm like, the fuck? Why don't I get to just be the fashion guy. Why, am I, why is there always some other words that have to start my line? And that reminds me that I'm not, I don't get to just be free, chill, fun, tan. I have, they, they, they want me to uh, speak for a community. I don't. I speak as tan France only. If I, if I do something bad, if I do something good, either way, I don't care. I don't speak for a whole community. I speak for myself. I want to just be, be visible. That's all I ever wanted, to show a version of my people that you've probably never seen before. Uh, that's all I ever wanted. I never suggested that I might speak for entire community. And there are millions of us. And that's a lot of pressure to put that on a person. And so that was the, re the, the main reason why I was panicking so hard. And it's a, the, the same thing that they do every day till this day, to this day. You, it, it, just look at it later. When you Google an article about the Fab Five, they will only ever say their names. They will always say the other things before my name. Extraordinary. What an extraordinary answer. I think the 10-year-old Tan, Fran Tan France would be very proud of the, I'm not going to say your age, Thanks. Tan France we have on the stage now. 36. Um, I, I, what? I, I know, it's shocking. I hide it so well. This gray is the highlights. Um, <laughs> I, you know, when I, uh, I, when I think about me as a kid, if you had told me that there'd be somebody like me on TV who is Asian, on a global show, I'd be surprised. If you told me that there's an LGBT person who's on a global show, I'd be surprised, just allowed to be themselves. And if you told that there was a combination of that, where I would see a version of myself on TV, I would say never in my lifetime. You're off back to the US tomorrow. Yeah. Season five. Season five. Yeah. So what do you know about what you have to do the day after tomorrow? Actually, nothing, and, and, and that's not a joke. I really don't know. So um, I want to talk to you real quick about how real queer I is. You know you watch reality shows like The Kardashians or The Housewives 
or uh, the, oh, I, I don't know the English versions, but whatever the English versions are. Um, ground force. Ground force. <laughs> then yes. Um, they're not, then they call them reality shows, but they're not. Like they're, they're, they're very heavily produced. When you see fights on, oh, um, Love Island. Oh, I keep calling it Lover's Island. Love Island. <laughs> when you see Love Island, that it's heavily produced. Somebody's encouraging them to fight. Like they're saying, uh, uh, Britney said this about you, Veronica, you should go and say this. Like it's very produced. Um, we don't have that. And so when you watch the show and you watch me and the boys say hello to Tom Jackson for the first time, that 100% is the very first time we've ever met him. Whatever you see us say, hear us say on the show, say, watch, sorry, what you hear us say on the show, what you see us do on the show, Nobody's told us to say or do those things. And once we've done it, it's never reshot. You get one chance to say whatever you want to say, and then we move on to something else. Have you, have you ever, and I don't want names. Yeah. I mean, I do, but you're not going to give me them. Have you ever gone, oh, for fuck's sake. And you've, oh, yeah. <laughs> no, but not just, not just for the camera, but in the car. Oh, so you gone, no, seriously, this is a shit one. Yeah. <laughs> yes, of course. Okay. It's not that there's a shit one. I always think, how the fuck are we going to save this guy? Like, <laughs> you see the situation, you're like, I can't. I, I don't have enough of a skill set to be able to change this man's life. It, but I'm good, but... <laughs> I know. Yeah, there, there are a few of those. And you can usually see the shock on my face when I walk in. You're like, oh, that's one of those episodes. Um, yeah, so, um, so, uh, so truly what you see, so when Greg asks, do, do I know anything about season five? I actually don't. I start shooting, not tomorrow, the day after. I have no idea what the, the plan is. I just meet the person and hope for the best. <laughs> but season four is coming out July, uh, July 19th. And that's also, in, that's also in Kansas Great. City. Great. Well, we're excited for it. I actually don't know how much time we've got left. Uh, you don't care, do you? It's, quite, it's fun, isn't it? I could, talk, I could do another two hours, but there's some people panicking in the wings. So I've got a, uh, where's this? I've got a bag of... Yeah. They gave, they gave me a branded pathetic penguin bag. So. <laughs> <laughs> need, to be, need to be reminded. Oh, do you want to do the do, throw the yeah. imaginary ball? Throw the ball. Throw the ball. Oh. Throw the ball. Oh yeah. Um, He's such a dad. He's such a dad. I love it. Do you want kids, by the way? I re I want six. I actually no legitimate. My husband will only allow me to have four, um, but I'm sure you can tell I'm the one who controls this marriage. So. <laughs> We'll get to four, and then I will manipulate, manipulate him to have two more. In here, you might have guessed some questions. Uh, Emily says, you've changed the lives of so many heroes, but how, was meeting them, how has meeting them changed you? Uh, that's a really good question. What was the name, sorry? Emily. Emily, that's a really good question. Thank you for that. Um, uh, it's actually changed me a lot. Up until the point when I started meeting the heroes, I would go in nervous thinking, I, I, we get a little bit of information beforehand, it's called a dossier, where we'll get like a questionnaire answered. Um, things like, what do you do for a living? Have you ever met a person of color before? Have you ever spoken to a gay person before? Um, and I was really worried thinking, I don't know how I'm gonna connect with these people. This person's never met somebody that looks like me or my boys, and they might be super rude and offensive, and I might have these judgments of them that I, that I won't be able to handle. Um, and so I was very scared meeting almost everyone for the first few weeks, and then I realized that's, that's, my, um, that, that's me being really judgmental uh, of them. They're actually the nicest people. They just need you to have a conversation with them, and it, it's a two-way street. And so it's just taught me to be a lot more open-minded. It doesn't matter what somebody's political affiliation is. It doesn't matter what party they're voting for. I can find connection with anyone. I've just been reminded by Emily's question, actually, something else I wanted to ask you about from your book, which is the bit where you talk about people sliding into your DMs. Oh, yeah. The famous people that you were shocked at going, oh, my God, they've contacted me. Names. Give me names. I can't give you, like, many. I'll give you a couple. Um, I, want, I don't ever I want, give this publicly. I, I want three. Ah. Oh. And then we will unlock the doors. Uh... Um, Gigi Hadid was the first one, and her and I are, have become really close friends. Uh, who else? Who else? Who else? Um, Tina Fey and I became really good friends. She's a massive comedian in the U.S. A gasp, an actual gasp. Yeah. Um, she's the queen of comedy, and she's incredible. Um, who else? I w did somebody say Adele? That is my dream. If she stepped into my DMs, I would be. That sounded over. like Bella's voice. Was that my wife's voice? Fucking hell. Um, I wish. 
I'm praying for it. If we pray hard enough, hopefully it'll come through. Uh, no. Uh, so no Adele yet. She's no not. Adele yet. No Adele yet. Okay. That's it. You're panicking. I uh, know. That's it. I'll give you two. That's all I've got. Okay, Courtney. I'll has tell the, you the other. Courtney has another question. I'd like to ask you what it was like working with Taylor Swift on the "You Should Calm Down" music video. Okay. So, listen. No shade to anyone else in that video. I have the best part. That's just the way it is. It's just the way it is. But for the best part, I had to sacrifice hanging on set with Taylor Swift. I didn't actually get to meet her on the day. She FaceTimed, um, but I didn't actually get to meet her. <coughs> because, um, so I have a new show called Next in Fashion. I was recording the finale that day. Uh, it's with Alexa Chung, who is awesome, like incredible, incredible. Um, and we were shooting the finale of that show la that day, so we, we, I wasn't allowed to leave. And uh, so the boys all did their scene with her. And then the next day, I did it on a green screen. And so that's why I have a solo, and I'm not with the boys. I know, I know. It's a great solo that we're going to ask you to do it at that carafe in a minute. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, easy. No. <laughs> um, it's, I'm sure you, well, maybe you saw, uh, you all listened to BBC Radio 1, duh. Uh, and I'm Matt Edmondson. So when uh, Greg's not doing the show on the weekend, Matt Edsman, Edmondson and Molly King do the show. And, uh, and I actually just told them that it was CGI. <laughs> oh, I love a gasp. <gasps> I love a gasp about tea. Um, do, you, do, you have a, do you have a name for your fans? Yeah, I call, the, uh, I, I call them uh, the Frenchies. The Frenchies? Yeah. Do they know that? No. Okay. The Americans know that. The Are Ameri you okay with that? That's a yeah. cute name. The, the Americans know it's the Frenchies. The Frenchies. Yeah. Not the Tanners. N no, because that makes them sound like they've got terrible tans, like orange, horrible tans. Okay, just yeah. an idea. <laughs> Bethan says, as we know from your show and your social media, you have a really sweet tooth. If you could only eat one dessert for the rest of your life. You don't even need to finish the question. I know it already. Uh, a pan au chocolat. Easy. Oh. Easy. Not really a dessert, but I will let you off because I would choose the same How thing. How is that not a dessert? It's got chocolate in its pastry. But it's a breakfast, isn't it? We pretend it's a fucking breakfast. It's not a breakfast food. It's like it's, you're, it, a dis you're a disgrace to your surname. <laughs> Yeah, uh, pan au chocolat. What would they say? The French would not accept that as a dessert. They're, they're, they're trying to make themselves feel better about being gluttonous, like it's clearly a dessert. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, we'll do another one from here. Uh, <laughs> Hannah says, uh, what is the most memorable transformation that you were part of on Queer Eye? Um, they're all, I love them all. The most dramatic reveal was Jodie Castellucci, the camo lady. When she walked out, the shock on our faces was real. Like, she looked dynamite. But my favorite has to be the Jones sisters, the barbecue sisters. Yeah, love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. And do you get to catch up with them? I saw the barbecue sisters just a few days ago. I love them very much. I saw Mama Tammy, who's formidable. Um, yeah, I see them already. I'm seeing Skylar next week. Yeah, we, I see them all. All right, we'll do another because we're, we're on a roll yeah. here. I want to get through as many fan questions as possible. Sorry, as many Frenchies questions. I've got a question. Tanners. Are you sweating like a pig or is it just me? Uh, I, well, I tell you what is, because it's a leather-backed sofa, my back is probably... Yeah, I don't sweat a lot. I really, this is the first time in a really long time I'm like, oh, I am actually really hot. Is that because it's enjoyable sweat? Have you enjoyed yeah, it? Yeah, well, I'm sat across from you, which is... Um... <laughs> that glow up was tight, I told you. <laughs> Tom says... What is your favorite thing to do in your spare time away from being on Queer Eye? Yes, this is a really good question. I was going to get to that, actually, because what is a... When you're... You don't have many days off. I don't. I've had six days off this year. What's the real like, day off for Tan? It wasn't, um, it was a perfect day. The real day. day off is... Okay, this is going to sound so sad. Remember that... It's literally six days this year, so this, is, this makes sense. I sit on my sofa. I don't set my alarm in the morning. I sit on my sofa in my home in Salt Lake, and I watch TV. It doesn't have to be Netflix. I just watch TV, and I eat as many sweet things as physically possible. Pan With my husband, yeah, yeah. Okay. I usually bake a lot. I bake a lot. <laughs> I will bake a full uh, tray of 12 muffins and I will eat them all legitimately within a few, within a, within a few hours, not days. What, what would be your showstopper? Ooh, my showstopper, okay, it doesn't look like it. There's a, a, a Great British Bake Off person in the audience who I'm obsessed with. His name is Stephen, and he's wonderful, and I, he made me a cake today, and I'm really excited. Um, where are you, Stephen? Anyway, he was one of my favorite. Can you say hello, Stephen? Hi, there where he is. are you? There. Woo! Oh, my God, I'm such a Stephen fan. 
He should have won. I don't care who else is in the audience that won. I don't care. He should have. He was absolutely should have won. Um, I, I wrote to BBC because I actually have that email and I complained. Um, <laughs> Uh, you're the person who complains. You are, are you a complainer? I'm a, no, I'm not. Just when somebody doesn't win a show that I think they should have won. <laughs> That's the only time. I use my power for weird things. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, I don't do a proper show, showstopper because they're always really impressive and I'm not that creative. But the thing that usually goes down really well at a party is this. It's, in my opinion, the best chocolate cake you will ever have in your life. Just chocolate cake. It's so good. I know that sounds simple. But it's, do you know who the Barefoot Contessa is? Okay, she, it's her recipe, and it's just heaven. And it, yeah, it's heaven. <laughs> I want to do this again sometime. I, know. It's so, I could do another hour of chatting. Me too. But we, um, we've got some things to throw out to the audience in a second. Yeah. I want to, I want to leave. Uh, there's so many things I want to talk to you about. I want to leave on a high. Yes, please. I love oh. getting high on stage. I want, to, I want to leave. Actually, two more things. There's one, there's you're, one allowed to, you're allowed to do that in America, just so you know. Anyway, you're probably not allowed one, to do it. One, one serious, and then one funny at the end. Go. My, my serious one was, I think, about was, was the, you tackle masculinity, masculinity so well in the book. Thanks. Um, when did you stop worrying about what people thought of you? Was there a moment that you, was there a transformational moment that you, transformative moment you had where you stopped worrying and you didn't worry about crossing your legs, you said in the book, or mm. you know, your, gest, your, your, mm -hmm. your, your gestures? Did mm -hmm. you, was there a moment? You know, I, I had an answer for this and I was really proud of myself when I wrote the book because I thought I've really come a long way and I really, really let myself down today. And it's the first time I've done it in years. I went to a friend, uh, with a friend who's in the crowd um, for coffee earlier on and uh, I took my waist belt off because I was worried that somebody might call me a fag in the street. Um, a fag, sorry, means gay in America. Um, I, 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 yeah, I worried that somebody might call me a name. Uh, and so I took it off and it was, and I, 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 afterwards I was really humiliated thinking, what? a fucking idiot, like why did you have to change your behavior for other people? But up until that point, I, I, I felt really liberated. I feel like I get to be whoever I wanna be. Nobody gets to tell me to uncross my legs. And that happened probably shortly after I married Rob, my husband, uh, I, I started to realize that I didn't have to fake it for anybody else anymore. If you don't know I'm gay, when you when I tell you I'm married to a man, like there's, there's something wrong with you, not me. Um, so I, there's no point trying to hide it anymore. Like I'm married to a man. I'm clearly gay. I am who I am. Uh, and if that you have a problem with that, that's your problem. That's definitely not mine. Well, actually, yes, of course. And actually, that leads me nicely into the final my final thing, which yeah. was I wanted to talk about your Nokia 6210. Yeah. So there's a, there's a chapter uh, in the book. Yeah. Which, which is called Nokia 6210. Yeah. So tell us about that, the significance of that handset. Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm calling out apparently everybody I know in the audience. Um, there is a very- We should explain to the children. They probably don't know what that is. Oh my gosh, yeah. Okay, a Nokia 6210 is a, a phone, a phone that didn't have the internet. Can you believe? Um, and it's a phone that, well, that you couldn't watch movies on and there was no color. Um, it sounds so, like hell. Yeah. Do you know, have you ever seen those weird phones in rooms that are connected to a wall? <laughs> it was just after they, they went away. Um, and so you couldn't really do much with them. But uh, I've got a very special friend in the audience. Her name is Kiri Pearson. And she is one of my oldest friends. And, uh, and I was really, so when I was about 17, close to 18, I was really scared to come out. I lived in a very conservative community. And, uh, and my 6210, I could, I could do a whole text without ever looking at my phone, like type out a whole text, because it was so small. And I, I, I used, like it was my party trick, it was so lame. I, was, I should have mentioned I was a real dweeb. Um, and so <laughs> that was the most exciting thing I could do in my life. So I could text um, without looking at my phone. And so I sent, uh, I, I, I was talking to Kiri and we were talking about random stuff when you do at uh, that age. And I had had a date with my then boyfriend um, and I'd messaged her to say, um, I met somebody. And she was like, all right, what's her name? And I said something along the lines of, his name is Gareth. Um, and she just turned to me very kindly and said, tell me about it. And I felt so comforted and I felt so safe. Uh, and it was the first time I ever thought, I think life might be all right because she didn't treat me any differently. She was just like, tell me about him. I just want to make sure you're happy, that's all. It was the most beautiful thing. So, Kerry, wherever you are in the audience, I'm forever indebted to you. Well, Tan, I, I think we should finish there. Yeah, me on the, too. On a, a that note, was a lovely one to end on. On a note of positivity, and, yeah. and thank you on behalf of everyone here for doing a show 
which does spread kindness and positivity and in Thanks, inclusion man. and all those things that we all value so much. Thanks, we, but we don't see enough of on TV or radio or, on, or online or wherever. So, ladies and gentlemen, please show your appreciation for Tam France. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It feels... Last thing, last thing I'll say. It feels so special to be here in England and for you guys to show so much love and support. Like, I can't even tell you how much I appreciate it. I truly am so proud to be British. Uh, and so thank you all so much for showing so much love and support. I, 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 I appreciate that. But we're gonna, we've got something for you. We've, hang on. I'll, I'll hold them. Okay, a few nights ago, I wore a naturally tan t-shirt. It's a, a, a picture that my husband drew, drew for the book. Um, and so we're going to try and pass it. I'm a gay man, you see, and I can't throw very far. Um, but I'm going to try. <laughs> go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. Yes. Can I, can I try the, the top deck? Oh, my God, try, 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 try. Cricket, cricket. Oh, cricket. sorry. <laughs> sorry, I told you I can't throw. Close. Okay, top deck, top deck, top deck. Top, 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 top. Go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. Come on, straight man. Holy shit, close. Try again. No, no, try. One more. No, no, that, it, the ones that already rolled up. Yeah, yeah. Go on, 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 go 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 because it's really embarrassing if you don't make it at this point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Final one. Get it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Go, 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 go. Oh, no. Oh, no. You know, it was still really impressive. I could no way get it that far. So let's try some of them. It unraveled. Please wear them. I love this t-shirt so much. I feel this has descended into pantomime. And it's great. <laughs> oh, shit. I'm going to have such a painful arm tomorrow. I can't do overarm. I'm going I'm to I'm give you my last one. Ah! The final one. Here you are, my love. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Thank friend! you so much. Thank you so much.